cross currents in the economic data, in the virus, and in the markets as we look for direction. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on whether the numbers show we didn't need to be as concerned about inflation as we thought. The figures this week actually looked uh, more ominous relative uh, to uh, history. And Blair Efron of Centerview Partners on what the C-suite thinks about the tax debate that's raging down in Washington. The core values the president has put forward is reverse the most negative impact of the Trump tax cuts. It is the biggest economic blunder I've ever seen a country make. If you were looking for some clear direction, this may not have been your week. Disappointing China retail sales numbers raised questions about growth in the world's second largest economy. I think the numbers coming out of Beijing today, not only on retail sales, but also on property and industrial production, all suggest that the Chinese economic recovery is going to be slower and bumpier than, than folks expected. U.S. CPI numbers were surprisingly mild, raising the question whether the Fed was right in saying inflation is merely transitory and maybe giving more leeway to the Fed to keep the QE coming. In August, you saw price declines in sectors like hotels and airlines. That was just because of Delta. Those declines won't last. But persistent supply chain issues with a surge in the price of oil raised the specter of inflation yet to come. And as the debate heated up about booster shots, Broadway returned to New York City, raising hopes for the city. This is a city where there are 10 million dreams vibrating. We are about to wake up and ignite all of those dreams, and we do it by giving the comfortability of public safety, safety from COVID, and ensure that people could come back into their office spaces. But all in all, the markets didn't much like all those cross currents that they saw this week, with the S&P 500 having another down week and flirting with its 50-day moving average, while the yield on the 10-year Treasury moved up above 1.35, all in all, sort of a risk-off sort of week. To take us through what she's seeing in the markets these days, we welcome back now Sarah Ketter, CEO of Causeway Capital. It is named the Morningstar International Manager of the Year for 2017. Sarah, thank you so much for being back with us. So give us your sense of these markets. What are they telling us? Markets are driven by liquidity. They always have been and they always will be. Liquidity is incredibly important for asset prices. And we've had so much of it. We've had an extraordinary amount of quantitative easing globally and out of necessity due to the pandemic. But tapering is now in sight. We don't know precisely when, but we know it's coming. And the Fed will engage in tapering, buying less bonds, and so likely will the European Central Bank. That's less money created. That's less rocket fuel for equities. And my, I think the Causeway team, we recognize that we've been through a very buoyant period and investors have been willing to pay almost anything to get growth. But now sobriety is setting in and that's some of what we think is happening in markets and we've seen this week. So does that mean, Sarah, that a lot of equities are overpriced in your judgment, given all that liquidity? Uh, equities are all, it's just a question of where the alternative is. And with bond yields at, at infinitesimally low levels, that makes equities very attractive. But as yields rise, and they likely will, we don't know by how much, but if any of the inflation signals we have become more persistent, and or as the money supply is reined in, that's likely to put some upward pressure on bond yields. And that in turn makes the discount rate on stocks, which are just the present value of all the cash they can generate into perpetuity, it makes that, that discount rate higher. And as a result, valuations tend to come down, stocks tend to derate. And the more long duration the stock, the more the cash flows that are promised far out into the future, those stocks will derate more. Just the absolute opposite of what we've seen in a tremendously exciting bull market. So, Sarah, there's a lot of talk about tapering, so-called tapering, both in the United States with the Fed, but also over in Europe as well. Sooner or later, they're going to have to take some of those liquidity out of the market, I'm assuming, right? Trees don't go to the sky. Uh, does it matter to investor when they do that, or is the more important thing that they will have to do it? 
well, if we knew precisely when we could be ex market timers and get all kinds of accolades, but we don't know and nobody knows. And for that reason, it's very important to be very diversified. We at Causeway in our fundamental portfolios in international and global equity, we've taken risk off this year. We've seen a huge rally in cyclicals. In fact, equity markets just about everywhere have been led by cyclical stocks, financials, materials, industrials, with just a few exceptions. And those stocks have done really well in anticipation of economic recovery. So it's it's time to bank some of that and, and go to more defensive areas. We like, for example, pharmaceuticals. We want to get income and we want great balance sheets and companies that even with less liquidity in markets, the stocks are going to hold up. That's really important. It's a full cycle we need to invest through, not just the up cycle. So Sarah, one of the things I find fascinating is your idea that you want to invest in the least popular segments of equity. Uh, and one of them, for example, let's pick on Chinese equities right now. There's a whole lot of reasons not to invest in Chinese equities. What makes you intrigued, at least, if not attracted mm. to Chinese equities? No, that's why I wore red. I, um, <laughs> I think it might help. Look, Chinese equities are, uh, China has been under so much regulatory pressure, Chinese companies in the private sector that they hadn't seen here before. And it's been happening all of 2021. It seems that one announcement follows another. And this has been very difficult for companies that had been lightly regulated. Some of this regulation, as we wrote to our clients and put on our website, is very appropriate, we think. It's more consistent to have, have safeguards for consumers and for workers and so on in, in industries than what China had here before. It's just the capricious side and the unexpected that unnerves investors. So assuming that China doesn't make, the Chinese government doesn't make uh, miscalculations and become inconsistent in how they levy regulation and they make it very transparent, this could, I know this sounds a little bit uh, controversial, but we think it could end up being quite good for the market because it lowers the risk, it increases transparency, and you can see, understand, and then invest around what the, what the constraints are for a business once the regulation is very clear. But what about that capriciousness? Because, I mean, you don't know, I mean, I, I don't know at least where they might wake up then tomorrow morning and decide, well, we want to go after that industry. Yes, and, um, and that's quite unnerving. The one that makes us most concerned was what happened in, in the for-profit education sector. The government, after many announcements, there was plenty of harbingers that indicated the government wasn't satisfied with it, but they made them non-for-profit. That is, that is severe and jarring, and we understand the investor response. But there are some great companies in China that have such extraordinary balance sheets that they can pay fines to the regulator, they can make acquisitions, they can ultimately return a lot of capital to shareholders. Companies like JD.com or Baidu in search, as well as in AI and cloud, that, that if you can just get through this period for investors, just don't, don't look, just own these companies because they will be great in the future. It's just very hard when there's so much negativity, especially in the press. And that's part of what we do. We take a much longer time frame and how we invest. But that is one area, China. And another area that's really interesting you didn't ask me about was, was what in the cyclicals hasn't, hasn't rallied, and that is memory semiconductors. Those stocks have been a real drag for our clients here to date, and yet they're phenomenal. A consolidated industry, high barriers to entry. It's an incredibly capital-intensive industry. And the amount of memory chips that are used in our very data intensive economy is skyrocketing. The demand is going to be higher than we've ever seen it. So even with the increase in supply that's inevitable, we are convinced there will be so much need in mobile communications, you know, the new the iPhone 13, much more memory intensive in AI, in, um, in electric vehicles, all any kind of autonomy, smart cities, smart factories, so much memory needed. So in that respect, that's another place to go that should, we think, be somewhat resilient to this uh, diminishing amount of liquidity that we expect ahead. So if there's potentially surprise upside to some of those memory semiconductor giants, as you, as you refer to them, what's the market fail? What are you seeing that the market's missing? Mm, I just, my colleagues and I think the market is very short term and is looking for a downturn in price in the first quarter of next year and maybe not looking beyond that which is, um, is, there may be a downturn in price. There's likely, there's always a cycle in these. And in the past, they've been very severe cycles, like big swing up and a crash downward. So we, um, 
you can certainly understand why investors might be hesitant. However, the balance sheets of these businesses are fantastic. And they, because I mentioned earlier, they've consolidated their fewer competitors. And as a result, that creates something called discipline in how they add supply. So this cycle should look very different from prior, which means these stocks won't sell down to book value and, and then go rallying up again. And that's the more consistent performance that we like to see out of stocks, especially in technology and the more cyclical, economically sensitive part of technology. Really intriguing. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being back with us. It's Sarah Ketterer. She's Causeway Capital CEO. Coming up, the business school rankings are out, and we talk with the dean of the Dartmouth Tuck School of Business about how he came out and what his students are looking for in a business education. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Bloomberg Business Week released its annual ranking of the nation's business schools this week. And number one, once again, was Stanford, followed closely by Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. Welcome now. It's Dean Matthew Slaughter. So, Dean, thank you for coming and congratulations. That's a pretty, pretty good performance there. Uh, give us a sense of where the business schools in America are today and how have they changed over the last 10 years? Uh, thanks, David. No, total team effort for Tuck as always. Uh, look, the demand what we see, Tuck, the, the interest in business education remains quite high. You know, this past cycle, our applications were up 11 percent. Last school year, they were up almost 10 percent, even amidst the turmoil of the pandemic. And I think what we hear from business organizations is they are seeking, as they have for quite some time, individuals who can harness information um, to articulate and defend points of view and environments of disruptive ambiguity and really motivate high-performing teams to bring those visions to life. Um, what's changed, I think, uh, is actually, I think, both the organizations that hire students and the students themselves, they recognize the complexity of our world in the 21st century. Yes, you need analytical skills and functional expertise in, in finance and accountancy, and yet that probably was never sufficient, but it's definitely not sufficient in our complex world of the 21st century. I think the interconnected issues around wealth and health and sustainability organizations and students alike are seeking developing those integrative skills that are going to allow them to navigate through what I think rightly is increasingly called uh, uh, not just shareholder, but stakeholder capitalism. Uh, so, Dean Slaughter, I want to unpack a little bit what you do while they're in business school and then where they go afterwards. But before we get to that, just give me a little bit of the numbers. Uh, where are applications for business schools, and particularly for, for T the Tuck School of Business? Where are you? Are they up, you're down? Where are you compared to history? Yeah, so compared to history, you know, a lot of business goes, there's always some cyclicality. So applications are slightly counter-cyclical with the strength of the labor market. Economists may all say that's because of the opportunity cost varying through time of leaving the labor market to earn a degree of any kind. Um, many schools go back a few years, saw a drop in demand, actually. That came a lot from international students that had a lot to do with rising supply-side competition in the rest of the world. There's good business schools come online more in the rest of the world. Uh, but we had talked in the past two years, have seen strong growth in applications. They were up again over 11% this past cycle, 10, almost 10% the previous cycle. Part of what we're also seeing is an increased breadth in interest. I think if you go back to an earlier period, the MBA degree was thought to be sort of a finishing degree for people who had already been in certain firms or certain occupations in capital markets and in consulting. Um, but we see an increased breadth in recent years among the uh, prospective applicants for what they were doing in their post-college years before thinking about an MBA. So the class of our first year class at Tuck now is a little under 300 students, 294 students. They came from 227 distinct employers in what they were doing before coming here to the Tuck School. So I think a recognition of the enduring value of an MBA, the communication skills, the analytical thinking, the self-awareness that are at the heart of management leadership in our world today, I think the breadth of interest that we see continues to grow. So, so I have a perception, which is not based on fact, just an impression now, that, that business schools changed over time, that I used to think it, the graduates, the best graduates went to a McKinsey sort of consulting firm or to a Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. on Wall Street. Then that evolved towards Silicon Valley, Valley a bit more on the tech side. Has the pandemic changed things at all? Because, uh, for example, I've talked to Albert Borler, who's the CEO of Pfizer. He said, boy, they, they just have so many people now wanting to go into to Pfizer. Yeah, so I think this, uh, one of the things that's terrific is the strength of demand for our graduates across a lot of industries. It is still the case, if I look at the recent years at Tuck, we've had very strong labor market performance for our graduates in terms of compensation and other measures. 
Um, consulting and finance are still very strong industries. So go, you know, recent years, I'd say about 40% of our graduates, their first step back into the labor market is consulting. As you said, the McKinsey's, the Bain's, the BCG's, the EY's, a lot of great firms. About you know, 20, 25% go into capital markets. I think investment banking is still a foundational next step for a lot of people. Technology relative to 10, 20 years ago has surged in terms of their demand for MBA graduates as well. That's about 20, 25% as tuck as well. I think the other trend that we see is whatever that first step is back into the labor market for our students post-graduation, I think they are um, even more likely a few years beyond to think about a transition into some particular industry vertical that might be clean tech, that might be in health tech, or to take a step into entrepreneurship. So many of our tech alums are very successful entrepreneurs. Some do that at that first step right beyond graduation, but many, like Sarah Ketter, who was with you before, Sarah's a great member of the Tuck class of 87. We have entrepreneurs who step into that um, new role of founding or joining some new business venture after they've done something in, uh, post-graduation. Uh, one of the things that we've covered an awful lot here at Bloomberg is some of the pressures being put on some of the younger bankers on Wall Street. And by the way, perhaps corresponding to that, the rapid increase in salary levels. Maybe they have to pay them more money. Are, are people sure. more reluctant to go to banks or uh, having getting paid much more money, are they more eager to go to banks? Uh, great question. I don't think they're more reluctant to go to banking. I think it's a couple of things. One is graduates, whether they're undergraduates going into those analyst programs or our MBA graduates, they want to receive a fair kind of market compensation for the skills they're bringing to their organization. And again, the demand for those skills globally continues to rise quite sharply. So they care about compensation. I think one of the changes, to echo on your earlier question, I think there's a bit more sense of our MBA graduates, definitely talking in other industries, they're devoted to their careers, and yet they want to have work that helps them live their lives, as opposed to sort of living to work. And so I think individuals are more seeking a match with an organization that thinks about the stakeholders that a global organization connects with, and they see the leaders in those organizations articulating values and taking stands on issues that um, are broad definitions of who are the stakeholders for these companies. And so I think that's a change compared to an earlier time. Our students then, what they want to learn in and out of the classroom reflects that, and I think the organizations that are recruiting our students, they need to present a value proposition for that. And I think that's really uh, exciting, and I think it's going to help our world you know, better the world through business as we echo our mission statement in Tuck. So I have no doubt that you don't have any shortage of applicants to Dartmouth Tuck, and by the way, that they go on to really successful careers. But is that equally true throughout the range of business schools? Is there increasingly sort of a sorting uh, of the top schools really doing extremely well? And maybe in the middle range, maybe it's not such a good investment, frankly, to go to business school. Yeah, boy, great question. Um, like a lot of other industries we see, I think there is a sense where some of the more successful organizations, they're seeing strong demand. For us, again, the demand is joint between the prospective students and the organizations that hire them. And I think some of the um, organizations in the past were quite good, and yet in sort of a general growth market, which was business education in the last part of the 20th century and the first maybe decade of the 21st century, they were able to build programs and have them scale, especially as the rest of the world was recognizing the value of an MBA. But you're definitely right that in recent years, there's been more of a quality sorting and every organization, Tuck no different, has had to be very clear about what is its particular value proposition to the market and what, what it thinks it's delivering on. So we speak of a personal and connected and therefore transformative experience here at Tuck. Um, making sure that we are uh, delivering on that is, is why we wake up every day. And I think. MBA education, like a lot of other industries, there's been this competitive dynamic that you point to. So it, it keeps us um, waking up every day and listening even more intentionally to our students, to our great faculty, right. to the organizations that are part of our ecosystem. And finally, Dean Slaughter, uh, there certainly is a premium being put right now in a lot of business generally, and particularly the financial industry, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do we have the same issue in the business school? So yeah. how diverse is the Dartmouth Tuck School? Uh, boy, it's definitely uh, the case that business schools are becoming more diverse, rightly so, compared to an earlier time. That's the case for us as a talk. I think it's a journey for all of our schools. Uh, many of our schools in particular need to make more progress on how many students we have who self-identify as underrepresented U.S. minorities. I know we at Tuck are working hard at that. We've been working very hard on building towards gender parity in our classroom as well. So the past couple of classes at Tuck have been very close to 50 percent women, just a little bit below that. So. The students want it because they recognize that diversity of experiences and ideas and aspiration enriches their learning. Again, the companies that are our partners with this, 
they value that diversity in and out of the classroom because they realize they need it in their organizations. So I think that's one of those growth opportunities for business schools and for higher education more generally. So we're making good progress in that in the industry in general, I think. For us at Tuck, it's a vitally important piece of what we do. Just very briefly at the end, Dean, how much of that is money? That is to say you need to provide for more money for tuition and, and expenses? Look, we generally, for every one of our students, have to be sure that we're delivering a value proposition. I'm proud to say that we held tuition flat this year at the Tuck School, no increase. I think there was an era in the 20th century where rising tuition at rates greater than the general rate of price inflation was right. what the market um, could bear. Right. I think that era is largely over. So regardless right. of whatever are the talents and, and the background right. that a particular student brings, right. we need to be honoring the investment they right. make with us with a, with a fair value. Great to have you with us, Dean. That's Matthew Slaughter. He is the Dean of the Dartmouth Tuck School of Business. Coming up, we take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look at what lies ahead next week on Global Wall Street. David, it's a busy week for central banks in Asia with policy decisions due from Japan, Indonesia, Taiwan, Pakistan, the Philippines and China. Bets have been building for the PBOC to cushion slowing growth that's been exacerbated by weakness in the property market, which has also put a big dent in iron ore prices as Chinese steel demand softens. And against that backdrop, Evergrande's troubles will remain in focus as it looks likely the developer will miss a Monday deadline to pay interest on bank loans. Denny? Thanks, Sophie. Well, it's a week where central banks will be in focus. We have the BOE and Norges Bank, along with Sweden's bank. They're likely to hold, save for Norges Bank. At the same time, we'll be looking out to see if any European regions or the UK approve a COVID-19 booster shot. Romaine? Thanks, Danny. Monetary policy setters gather next week for a meeting most investors anticipate will involve discussions about when and how the Fed should taper its pandemic bond buying program. Signs of a slowdown in the economic recovery and evidence of persistent inflation may complicate making that decision. The economic issues the FOMC will debate also are likely to be laid bare by some notable companies reporting earnings next week. FedEx has benefited from increased package volumes but is now facing wage pressure and capital investment needs that may hamper profit margins. Nike is contending with COVID-driven factory shutdowns in Vietnam, which have only worsened since the apparel maker last reported earnings back in June. And home builder Lennar has seen its stock price fall significantly since the start of the month amid signs that the housing boom is slowing. All three report earnings next week. David? Thanks to Sophie, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, Congress spent a lot of time this week on taxes, and specifically how to raise them. We talked with Blair Efron of Centerview Partners about what all those tax hikes would mean for business. That's next on Wall Street Week. I'm Bloomberg. Build Back Better. That's the promise presidential candidate Joe Biden made to voters over a year ago. It's time to reverse the priorities in this country. It's time to help small businesses. When the federal government spends taxpayers' money, we should use it to buy American products and support American jobs. And that's the plan President Joe Biden laid out to Congress starting last March. But from the beginning, he insisted he would not just borrow to get it done, that we had to figure out how to pay for it. The investments I'm proposing will be fully paid for over the long term by having the largest corporations, including the 55 corporations that paid zero federal tax last year, and the super wealthy began to pay their fair share. 
And this week, we got some specifics on just what it will take to pay for what the president wants. It may not be as dramatic as the fashion statement made by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at the Met Gala this week, but it still would be the most sweeping set of tax increases in nearly 30 years, including raising the top rate on personal taxes, increasing taxes on capital gains, and imposing a 3% surcharge on anyone making more than $5 million a year. And it's not just individuals who'd get hit. The top corporate rate would go up to 26.5%. There'd be new levies on overseas corporate income. And the carried interest break so beloved by private equity would get cut back further, applying only if you hold the asset for at least five years before you sell it. Not surprisingly, Democrats and Republicans see these proposals very differently, with President Biden's chief economist claiming the corporate tax changes would bring more investment onshore. The core values the president has put forward is reverse the most negative impact of the Trump tax cuts and get this corporate tax reform right so that we are encouraging more incentives to invest here domestically. While Republicans warn these hikes would make American industry less competitive. They'll be crippling for Main Street businesses. Certainly they'll land on working families, but as importantly, we're gonna drive U.S. jobs overseas. Uh, and, And this is trying to fight our way out of the pandemic. It is the biggest economic blunder I've ever seen a country make. It's a fundamental clash of wills and of philosophies. But with a Democratic majority in both houses, it looks like we're in for a change. The question is, how big will it be? Well, whatever the politicians think about tax hikes, what do the people who will have to pay them think? Will they affect the way they do business? Welcome now someone who deals in the real world with real CEOs who make the decisions to drive the real economy. Blair Efron is co-founder and partner of Centerview Partners. Blair, great to have you back with us. You talk with CEOs all the time. You can understand why they might be nervous given what we just heard from President Biden saying, we're going to pay for this by making sure the largest corporations pay their fair share. Are CEOs concerned about this? First of all, thanks for having me back on. So what I would say is this. I think there is enough tailwind in the economy that um, we'll be able to do this comfortably. Let's have a little bit of historical perspective. Uh, Donald Trump cut taxes $2 trillion. Uh, if you look at the impact of that, uh, also negligible. In fact, if you go back to the second term of President Obama, compare that to uh, the Trump three and a half years before COVID, fundamentally, uh, under Obama, the market was up 9% more. Uh, growth during both periods is around 2.5%. The point is, I just don't think it's going to have a meaningful impact. Also, let's keep in mind that during COVID, uh, tremendous wealth has been created. The top uh, 10% have created uh, $10 trillion of wealth. Uh, I think the idea of uh, a tax uh, increase, particularly where half of it is corporate and uh, only half is personal, is something we can handle. Now, of course, the key very importantly, the key is that uh, it is done for uh, investment. And when we talk about infrastructure, be it physical or human, where the money gets applied, I think, is going to really be the most important question we have. And to the extent um, we really are focused on the physical side, water, airports, railroads, electric grid, that's a good thing. On the human side, to the extent it really goes to uh, caregivers who can get back to work to the extent it goes to education, uh, therefore getting more skills for uh, future employment, also a good thing. And we have a lot of, as I said, a lot of tailwind of the economy done right. This hopefully will keep uh, that tailwind on a much more sustainable trajectory. So, so Blair, I don't want to be too cute here, but I noticed a couple of things you didn't mention in there. Things like Medicare for the elderly, for vision and dental uh, help, things like uh, earned income tax credits and child tax credits. Because if you look at, like, the Penn Wharton budget model, they say those things don't improve productivity. The things you mentioned, Blair, do. So do you draw a distinction? Do CEOs draw a distinction between investment in something that's going to increase growth? I think we all draw a distinction. David, very fair question. We all draw a distinction. Uh, I think out of $4 trillion that we're talking about, you can... And again, that number will change, and we both know that. Um, Let's assume that, at least what I've seen, two-thirds of it actually is investment-oriented. If you look at the uh, almost $6 trillion already spent, clearly, when you get 6.5% growth last quarter, you can assume directly uh, 
uh, because the tailwind that's created. And I also, again, do think that given how well so many have done, uh, the idea of shared prosperity makes sense because really the goal here is to keep our economy growing on a stable basis. I think you're seeing uh, last quarter, potentially the, uh, the peak of GDP growth, but if you can get to the end of 22, into 23 and beyond and grow an economy at three and a half percent plus, that actually creates a lot of momentum for everybody. So talk about momentum, momentum talk about your business, by, because by all accounts that I've seen, your business is going crazy, the merger and acquisition business. How is it doing and why is it doing it? Great question. Uh, anybody involved in investment banking at this point um, has been doing well. There's obviously been uh, record volumes. You know, we've already done four trillion year to date, but then a perspective, uh, the largest year we've had in 10 years was four trillion. All that said, M&A really at this point has been a very consistent four trillion plus, four trillion minus market for the past 10 or 11 years. Why is that? Because I think one, companies have gotten very good about uh, the execution of M&A. They understand when they buy something exactly what they want to do in the short term. They understand how they want to grow it uh, longer term. Two, obviously disruption uh, across any business sector means that uh, companies must react much more quickly. Therefore, if you're looking to buy uh, versus build, chances are pretty good you will more quickly get the kind of capabilities you think you need to be competitive. And then three, and certainly not to be discounted, uh, financing environments haven't been better, whether it's on the debt side or obviously uh, on the equity side, given uh, where multiples are at the moment. Blair, one of the issues is supply, and particularly supply of workers in various parts of the economy. Uh, do you have enough bankers, young bankers, to do all this work that's coming in across the transom? So uh, in our business, it's a mentor business. It's a business that is absolutely an apprenticeship. Uh, we have great talent. Uh, we are hiring uh, aggressively, and I would say that uh, given the, uh, the need we have, it's not necessarily that we ever have enough, but we want to have the right people, and we think it still is an industry that att attracts uh, a great talent pool, um, a very diverse talent pool, um, geographically, politically, uh, DEI, and um, I think the industry's done a very good job uh, attracting a wider audience, which frankly we have to continue doing. And I think that said, the challenges we have in retaining talent and training talent, it's, obviously, it's no different than what you're seeing across any industry. Um, and it means we all have to continue to do a good job making the proposition for anyone who's going to come to a center view or anywhere else attractive enough and that the skills they learn are important enough and helping them launch their careers uh, in a uh, very mentored oriented perspective that's what we have to do. It comes down to the kind of culture you want to build. We don't focus uh, simply on, on what someone gets paid. That happens once a year. The other 30 to 60, 40 days a year, we're focused on the right kind of experience, the right kind of culture, uh, and the right kind of experience for the people we bring on. One I more. I would say one more thing. Oh, yeah, one more thing. Please. Yeah. If, um, if you would ask me about any business being able to hire as aggressively and comfortably as they have, um, where in many cases it's all been done by Zoom and done remotely, I would have said that uh, it just won't happen. The fact is, it's been an incredible innovation. And now that we've had all our people in the office, many of whom we've uh, hired just uh, remotely and have met for the first time, it actually has been a pretty uh, impressive thing for our organization and organizations, frankly, across all of business. Are you getting the right caliber of people? You said that you have to get the right people, but are the business schools generating them for you? We, we find the right caliber. There's just so many talented people. You have 3 million kids getting out of college every year. Um, they, as a big population, I think are as talented as I've ever right. seen. I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. We don't see an issue. With some success, I must say. Blair, it's always oh. a great pleasure to have you with us. It's Blair Efron. He is of Center View Partners, co-founder there as well as a partner. Coming up, we'll wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, as Wall Street Week continues on Bloomberg. This is 
Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, and we're going to conclude our week as we do every week with Larry Summers of Harvard, our special contributor here on Wall Street Week. So, Larry, let's start with all of the back and forth on Capitol Hill about the budget, about taxes. This week, uh, we've had a group of Nobel laureates in economics write a letter saying they think it makes good sense to invest, and in fact, it won't be inflationary. What did you make of that letter? I agree that we absolutely need a bill that contains substantial public investment, and I was glad to see the letter. I think the letter could have said more. It could have warned about inflation expectations becoming unanchored unless we pay for the investments we make with revenue increases. It could have stressed the importance of designing those investments so that they're maximally uh, effective with benefits uh, exceeding uh, costs. It could have very usefully warned against uh, budget gimmicks uh, where you only pay for investments for a limited uh, period of, uh, of time. Yes, we should and have and need to pass a major investment in the future of our country bill, but especially after the indiscriminate spending early this year, we need to do it in a rational, disciplined way. So, Larry, you mentioned inflation particularly, something we've talked about pretty much every week now. We got CPI numbers in the United States in this week, and they came in a little lower than people expected. Some people breathe the sort of collective sigh of relief. Uh, are we out of the woods yet, or is that premature? I think it's way premature. The labor market still looks extraordinarily tight. The most interesting number of the week to me was the New York Fed survey that really shows pretty clear evidence that both one-year inflation expectations and three-year inflation expectations may be becoming uh, unanchored. If you did the things that the inflation doves have done month after month, and you looked at uh, median inflation or you took out the outliers, the figures this week actually looked uh, more ominous relative uh, to uh, history. So we're not going to know yet, but the data flow, whether it's housing, whether it's more and more anecdotes in more and more places of supply chains, whether it's direct measures of expectations, looks increasingly concerning to me. So, so, Larry, one of the questions I have is, what's going on with the bond market? Because the bond market doesn't seem to reflect that. There's a real uh, divergence between CPI numbers and the bond market. Uh, why isn't the bond market reacting to what you're concerned about? I don't know. That's the biggest uh, puzzle in the situation uh, to, uh, to me. I think the bond market is heavily driven by the Fed, and I think the Fed is giving lots of evidence of uh, lack of uh, concern. There's some technical factors as well, but I, I recognize the anomaly, uh, David, and I think it, uh, it is a puzzle. It may reflect a set of very deep uh, forces that are pushing long-term interest rates down, the stuff I've talked about when I've talked about secular stagnation, with uh, higher propensities to save and lower propensities to invest. So, Larry, it seemed to be a week for letters. We not only had the Nobel laureates writing in about the budget, we also had Leon Panetta, former uh, Secretary of Defense, and other former uh, national security officials writing it's a letter saying we've got to be careful about applying or expanding antitrust when it comes to our tech companies because China's taking a very different course. China's embracing their big tech as what they call national champions. What is the challenge for the United States in both being competitive globally in tech but also making sure that our big tech doesn't get out of control? You know, this is going to be a big process challenge for the Biden administration for Brian Deese, the director of the National Economic Council, for Attorney General Merrick Garland, for National Security Advisor Jake uh, Sullivan. Uh, we've got to figure out that on the one hand, there's much to worry about coming from our tech companies on privacy, on market concentration, on what they're doing to uh, the nature of our public uh, dialogue, and we need public policy there. But they're also our national champions in important respects in key areas of competition 
around uh, the globe, what uh, Secretary Panetta was stressing. And we've got to make a policy that integrates those realities. And frankly, our national security establishment isn't used to thinking about the first set of realities, and our economic and antitrust policymakers aren't used to thinking about the second set of realities. And so the government's going to need to find a way of bringing them together so that we can craft uh, the right uh, nuanced policy. I think it's a hugely important area, and I think so far we've probably had too much in the way of sloganeering about uh, some of the risks on both sides, and we really need a very thoughtful and serious policy process that brings together different parts of the government that aren't usually in dialogue with each other. Uh, Larry, uh, you, of course, co-chaired a G20 panel to address how to really avoid the next pandemic. You have a piece out in The Washington Post this week. We have the United Nations General Assembly coming up next week. Uh, give us a sense of where you are in that process. Uh, you compare it to sort of Bretton Woods, a new version of Bretton Woods. U.S. leadership really got Bretton Woods done. Do we have that kind of U.S. leadership this time? I'm encouraged by what President Biden has said and by the meeting he's convening. Um, We've got this set of meetings this week and next week, and then we have a G20 meeting that'll take place at the end of the October. So I think the potential is there. But look, I want to take a big picture view on this, uh, David. We've been celebrating the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Something very important has happened. We haven't had a major terrorist attack again. That look, that's a great victory relative to what people expected on September 12th or October 12th of 2001, and we should give credit for that. But at the same time, I think with the 20-year Afghanistan war, with the Iraq war, with various changes that have taken place in the United States, people see many elements of overreaction and excess. I am worried that 20 years from now, 100 million people will have died in pandemics, and the world's climate will have been radically altered. And the concern will not be overreaction, but underreaction to what I think are an immense set of security challenges. And so I think there's no danger we're going to overreact to the pandemic threat or the climate threat. And there's enormous reason to fear that until we start seeing these as top national security challenges, that we're going to fall way short. Finally, Larry, I'd like to get one quick thought from you on something I know you've dealt with before, and that's the debt ceiling. Uh, we now are back up against that in Washington. It's not clear exactly when we'll run a crowd of it, sometime late October, maybe November 1st. We had Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury, this week calling up Mitch McConnell, the minority leader, saying, you've got to do something about this. He said, basically, it's up to you. What do you make of this debt ceiling? Why do we have the debt ceiling? Does it make sense? Are we dealing this in a, in a sensible, rational way? No. Um, as an investor, I would uh, hold treasuries because you're going to see a lot of stupid posturing and games, games of chicken in Washington. But I have every confidence that this will be worked out and the United States will uh, honor its uh, debts. As a Former Treasury Secretary, I empathize with Secretary Yellen, who's going to probably have a sleepless night um, or two along the way and is going to be involved in all sorts of uh, posturing that's uh, necessary as she explains what is and uh, what isn't uh, possible. Uh, this is an area where I think everybody just needs to uh, grow up. No one's really in doubt that when we have borrowed money, the United States is going to pay it back. And so this whole ritual of pretending that we're going to block paying it back, I think, is a fairly sorry spectacle for our country. It diverts enormous amounts of political energy that could go to solving real problems rather than artificial and contrived ones like the debt ceiling. Okay, Larry Summers Harvard, thank you so very much for being back with us. Larry, of course, is our special contributor here at Wall Street Week. Coming up, one more thought. Did we really need that California recall? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
finally, one more thought. What could you buy for $300 million? That's how much California spent this last week on its recall. And that's before you count the $70 million that Governor Gavin Newsom spent to keep his job. But in the end, it turned out it wasn't even close. We are enjoying an overwhelmingly uh, no vote tonight here in the state of California. And it's not like it hasn't happened before. We all remember back in 2003 when Governor Gray Davis lost his job only 10 months into his second term. But he had a lot of challenges. So let's be frank, they'd had the collapse of the dot-com bubble, which had really hit California. And even back then, they had a lot of wildfires. Everyone running for office in California is well aware that uh, the people in California have the first and last word. And if you don't like that, well, don't run for office in California, run someplace else. And, oh, oh yes, Gray Davis was up against a formidable opponent in the Terminator. But then again, Gavin Newsom, in some senses, was running against a different kind of celebrity in the form of our most recent president. The leading Republican running for governor is a, uh, the closest thing to a Trump clone that I've ever seen in your state. No, I really mean it. California has made something of a tradition of recall attempts for its governors. In the roughly 100 years they've had the statute for recalls, they have had no fewer than 55 attempts to recall the governor. Yes, if you're doing the math, that's roughly once every other year. So maybe, just maybe, it's time to rethink whether that's a really efficient way to use our time and our resources. And some people are saying that there should be reform. I think we should make some changes. Right now, only 12% of the electorate has to sign a recall petition. Make that 25%. I mean, this law has been on the books since 1911. Gavin Newsom, the current governor, has some ideas about what to do with that $300 million. If you look at his most recent budget for the state, he proposes, for example, doing away with the entire backlog of unemployment insurance claims, and also maybe forgiving all of the traffic tickets issued to all low-income residents in the state for the last six years. And the price tag for either one of those, well, it just happens to be, yes, you guessed it, $300 million. So you make the call. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.